Yeah, today, uh, I'm excited to be here. Actually, the PDF, it's nice to see people who have a passion for PDF, the same that you know, we tend to see within the group that we have here, but that doesn't always translate when you go out to the rest of the world and talk about things. It doesn't always translate to that, that you can actually talk through some of the PDF stuff. Today, when I, um, in, in the, my talk today, I want to talk a little bit about um, the history of how PDF got started and um, how we progressed over time. Uh, at the same time, we'll look a little bit about where PDF is um, today and what it means and what, it, uh, what, what, what it, we're, we're seeing and how it relates to the industry that's out there and then potentially talk a little bit about some futures and where potentially PDF could go um, if uh, we decide ultimately to do that and what, the, what really has changed um, over the course of time as opposed to a sing, you know, is, uh, you know, as opposed to a single Adobe product and offering and, and, and driven thing, it's now really about standards and it's about moving forward on this stuff. So we'll talk a little bit about that stuff. To uh, get started though, a little bit about my background. Um, uh, Leonard spoke a little bit about that, but I, I started here in 1994 so I've been working for 20 something years on PDF. And um, you know, I put the first font engine into Acrobat. So most people actually pity me um, <laughs> for having, uh, having that product. Actually, the interesting part about that, I think Bill McCoy said this one time too, like does he have any, McCoy, any code left in his thing? They quickly took my code out. Um, you know, the next release, they actually <coughs> generalized that to uh, a product or a, a, a Product called Cool Type, or not really product, a subset called to, uh, uh, called Cool Type, which the work I did predated that time, and uh, and then and right now Cool Type is the core font engine that's running um, Acrobat today, and most of the other Adobe products are there. So I, I started up as an engineer working on things, but over the course of time, um, my role has changed to kind of being a useless manager to becoming a useless executive to you know there. So it's gone really into a, a different thing. So now I'm VP of engineering, but I work on the, not only on Acrobat P and PDF, but also I have responsibility for mobile products and as well as um, the cloud offerings that we have. So it's kind of interesting because uh, every one of these spaces is very different and it's really interesting. It's hard to, um, it never feels like it's, it's old. There's always things going, there are always things going on. So my, my work really has spanned from the initial stages of PDF and what uh, we did with PDF, which is really to, to transfer, how do you take a, a paper document and transfer that over to an electronic form? And we call that e-paper, but that whole process. And fundamentally that was a lot of effort from the team of probably 100 to 150 people to build out that product and that offering to make that happen. So it, was a, it, it started off in that space and then moved on into other areas. When we first started, um, John Warnock, who was the, the, our founder of this company, was the key person who drove the promise of PDF. And his quote, I think, here, aptly describes really the, the vision that we had for the longest time. Um, this is all about how we can trans how we can communicate in a visually rich way electronically and this started off as project Camelot and uh, this was this actually was a little bit before my time but but fundamentally it it created the um, the the beginning of PDF PDF started as sort of an evolution of postscript postscript most of the time most of the company at that point was pretty much dedicated to working on the printed output part and it was, it was uh, pretty much viewed by, at that point, there were some fringe cases where people were trying to take PostScript and figure out how to make that electronic. Keep a, the output of PostScript and, keep, and, and use that as sort of a means to communicate back and forth, not just on a printer, but um, the beginning of, I guess, the, the very, the caveman version of the electronic document. Um, the problem with that is PostScript's a language and you have to kind of interpret it. You have to run the interpreter to actually see the output. It doesn't have anything that's document-based. It's no way you can randomly access page 35 of a document or anything like that. So John basically worked on 
with the, and built a team out, um, and I see some people there on, this on that team from a long time ago, uh, that, that developed the first version of PDF as a derivative of PostScript. No longer was there an interpreted language involved, it was all declarative. Um, and it had random access attributes that, which really made it very attractive. So if you wanted to bypass the 900 pages of the, of the thousand page document, you could do that pretty easily. Um, whereas before you had to generate, the, you had to run the PostScript program to find that happen. When that, I, I believe about 10 to 15 years of effort by maybe 100 people went into making that real. So that was a lot of work. And in fact, I remember back in the old days, um, there were a lot of people who thought, can you really do this? Can you really create an electronic document format that you can accurately re represent the printed output? And there, was a, there were a lot of questions as to whether or not there was a viable thing at all. Now, those people who knew the interns of it thought, yes, we could do that and we there. But the truth is, we we're always mapping from one imaging model to the next imaging model. There were always ch challenges making that happen. And over, over time, we were able to work that out. But, the, but it was one of those things that, from an outsider's point of view, was always a questionable thing. I, met, I can remember meeting many um, outsiders and thinking, is this really possible? Can you really do this? And today, it's crazy that you, can't, that you think that. But because we've gone through in, in that process before. But it really was. And not only was, it, was the first part of it, which is to generate electronic um, documents, but at the same time, the process when handling all the adjacent parts of that, um, forms. That, that doesn't exist on printers, so we created that, that on top of it. Commenting. Um, then you started to move on to other areas like uh, OCR. We had other projects that worked on trying to convert images into PDF. And we started inca incorporating that into, PDF, into Acrobat as well. So the project is a big pro was, a, was a big project that boomed out. I think the interesting part of this was um, John Warnock was the one, was probably the one guy that could make PDF happen at, at this company. And the reason for that was we kept on running into, in the early days, before the internet boom and all the stuff happened, there were constantly calls for our heads. I mean, there was like, let's just drop this project. It's not going anywhere. Um, how, how, how can we make money on this thing? And uh, in fact, we were always being compared to Photoshop, which at the time had a small, lean team that was developing this product and actually made a lot of money at the time. So we were constantly kind of pushing ourselves to kind of push for, uh, to compete with Photoshop. Um, and every, they looked at the resource allocation that was part of the Acrobat. Acrobat to do Acrobat takes a, a mass of people. And uh, that part uh, constantly caught, was, was the source of a lot of people saying, let's just drop this project, it's too costly. And at the time, it made sense to, to do that because uh, we weren't making much money. Our expenses were high. And only because John Warnock was the CEO of the company, he was the right guy that had the vision, at the same time, the power in the company to kind of keep it going, right? Until finally, and the reason for that, by the way, I remember talking to him thinking, and he, and he was always stunned by, why don't people get it? Why don't they understand that, that this electronic document format's gonna just, it's, it's gonna go. It might not happen yet, but it, it doesn't make sense that they don't get it. There were a few industry changes that ultimately started to really happen that made the difference there, though. And, that, and one of them was the internet. And the internet really created an environment where uh, you wanted to communicate with electronic document. You wanted to, to pass your document around to other people. And you could do that still before, but this really facilitated that process. And then the on, top, on top of that, and this is Leonard had alluded to this before, when with the internet, in, then all of a sudden the IRS got involved because they wanted their tax forms to be made available. Right? In the past, you used to have to go to the post office. Do you remember that one? To get their tax forms, you had to go to the post office to pick up a tax form. So they made it available on the internet, not as a form, but just as a flat document. And frankly, that one act, in addition to the internet, completely transformed the use of PDF. You need those transformative moments or actions where all of a sudden the, you get into that mode where the momentum starts to really happen and that starts to happen. Um, that, that, to, to me, that was the, the, the major thing that, in addition to all the features that we were doing, that sort of created the success of Acrobat. Okay. So
so that was sort of the past. Um, how has how has PDF really impacted the world today? And really, this come, this speaks to the brand of PDF. What is its value today? What do people perceive it to be? And how does it help? How is it useful to them? For a lot of people, for everybody, all your bank statements, all your financial statements, everything like that is online today, available as PDF. PDF is sort of a dominant file format in that case. Transactions of record. You buy something, you usually get a PDF file that represents the transaction that you can keep around all the time. PDF is perfect for that. Uh, documents of record in larger cases. The, you know, the mortgage statement or the marriage certificate or anything like that. Today, everything that represent is in paper predominantly goes through PDF. Now, PDF being a paper-based a format that transitions you from paper to digital is the natural place to be in, in, in all those cases. It's a natural file format to use. Today, my kids, they're in high school. Wow, that's amazing. Um, we'll see if they make it. Uh, but uh, they do all their work on iPads today. They don't have to print anything. They don't use email. It's kind of interesting. Um, except when talking to the old generation. Uh, but they do a lot of their work by getting their homeworks in P homework in PDF and other formats, but, but essentially they commenting, they do all their annotations and commenting directly in, in the file format. So it, it has transformed the way, the way kids manage their homework process today, the education system. White papers. White papers are both an opportunity for people to learn in depth about some subject and also for marketing to kind of get your hooks in you <laughs> in, the, in the sort of the web-based thing. It's always a, a two-edged sword here to learn something but then have them know they're gonna call you back later on in the process. But that's what happens today for white paper. Most of those are white or PDF. And really the paper, the digital transformation. Um, in having been around this thing for a long time, I have never, I, I'm always surprised how sometimes we think that we're farther along in the, in the transformation than people really, than, than pe we really are. Because we're living in Silicon Valley or in the technology area where this transformation has happened a long time ago, right, in, in, in sent effectively. But if you really look at the farmer in Iowa, you know, how much are they, are things really transforming to them? If they, if you're working in the Midwest somewhere or you're working out in a different country, that transformation right now is happening. The thing that I find interesting and we're talking in, in strategy there is a line item today in everybody's, any, every enterprise's IT budget for this transformation from paper to digital, right? That surprises me because I, thought, I would have thought this happened a whole long time ago. But the truth is right now, the, the biggest line item is this transforming to digital. Um, and so these technologies, which have been developed a while, are the ones that are really coming in, that, that are becoming more mainstream in every enterprise. Um, in, and so that the long tail of of companies are now starting to uh, embrace this model and move more and more to it. I think this is a general trend that we have to also really look at. <clears throat> we're, I'll be honest with you, we're also really into cloud computing uh, and cloud storage of things. Is this where other companies are? No, right? So we're farther along on the, on the path towards where other companies are going to be in the future then, then, then really they are. it's gonna take a while for that stuff to happen. And I think that sometimes we often tend to um, lose that concept and maybe make decisions that are more towards the technology future than maybe the rest of the company or the country is really ready to take. So just be, to me, that's a, it's a long sign. This long tail of digital transformation, it's gonna, last, it's gonna go on for another 20 years. It's gonna go a long time. Okay, so other areas, print production. Now this was the actual um, core root of PDF in the first place. Print production, having grown up in the printing world with PostScript, um, it made sense for PDF to be the data exchange format to go from uh, applications that, and especially with the, the, um, applica the applications at the time for that, that generated all these different places, though the commoditization sort of, of print, um, it made sense to have a file format at that point that you could transform to, and you could send to a print shop that could actually print it, right? 
having grown up in that process, the whole PDF was that, it was that part of it. Now, of course, you could generate PDF. As we've seen, you could generate PDF in any way um, that wasn't capable of doing that, but there is a standard today for print production that actually everybody follows that um, works really well, right? And so that's, that, that has transformed the, that particular industry, the desktop publishing industry. Other areas, companies today have, um, have a need to make sure that they control the content that goes out, right? And with support of things like redaction, document protection through DRM, certified documents, right? They can control the type of stuff that goes out. Redaction especially is, is one of those hard ones, right? Too much hidden information is in documents. Send a word file out and you know, it's amazing you can get some of the old information you never want available to you, right? And so having a model that, are, that supports carefully controlled information dissemination <coughs> is really a key thing in Acrobat and PDF in gen PDF, the, uh, the file format supports that case. Okay, um, accessible PDF. Now, this is an area that, that uh, I wish more, we had more success in this area. To be honest with you, we have a standard today for accessibility, but not enough documents follow that standard. Um, but it, and it's an important area where visually impaired people need to be able to participate in the digital world and that process. So uh, my feeling on this is we need, to, we need to step up our game a little bit more on accessibility, less about the file format because of the capabilities that are there, but more about really transforming that file format into a usable scenario that helps visually impaired, right? So, um, and then digitally signed documents. This actually plays into the high end of what I would think there's a big industry going on for. There's the e-sign capabilities for, um, that are not digitally signed, um, that, will, that, that are playing a big role and a big opportunity. And then there's digital signatures that in some segments of the world will become the standard for the way things work. So not just e-sign might not be acceptable in some cases in the future, or digital signatures, which has added security characteristics that allow to, to, for people to look at these documents and works way much better than the way things work in paper, right? And PDF is a key part of what goes on there. So, let's talk about a little bit, th that's how, that's the kind, those are the use cases that I would say define the brand of PDF. Um, how successful are we with this? Let's, how about from, from the usage perspective? Here's, let's talk about what we know. Today, there are 1.6 billion PDF files on the web. You can get that from a Google search. Um, that in itself, you think about that, and, and, and if you think about looking on the web, how often do you find, do you, do you use PDF files on the web? How many other PDF files are potentially available? Like I would say, to me, it's a very small subset of my PDF is from the web, but it's already 1.6 billion. Drop, we had a recent announcement with Dropbox, and they claim, th their number shows that there are 18 billion PDF files in Dropbox. Not said. Um, there are two billion PDFs that are opened every year in Outlook.com. Sixty percent of the non-image attachments that are PDFs in Outlook Exchange are PDFs. That are non-image attachments are PDFs that, now, that come from Outlook Exchange. 60%. This is the stuff that we're hearing, com we're regularly hearing from our cloud storage providers. PDF is the most common file format. In many cases, more than 50% of the files they have in their repositories are PDF. Seven, in, 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 the case, in the case with Box, 17% of files in Box are, are PDF. 73 million New PDF files are, are served every day in Google through mail and through Drive. Pretty cool. So, so I thought about, kind of interesting, we don't really, we don't really know, you know, we don't really know what the total number of PDFs are. So that kind of, and I'll just give you, you can kind of throw this away if you don't care. But, um, I thought an interesting exercise, how do you determine, how would you determine the number, total number of PDF files out there? 
So this is the exercise we went through. Let's assume that um, the number of files, think about the number of files that are generated for you and your family. Right? There are statements, there are transactions, there are financial statements, there are kids' PDF files for their school, all that kind of stuff. For you, a family of, and a family of four. If you don't have a family of four, grab some people, create a family. So the, uh, the, the number of files that are pushed to you, or pulled, that, you, that are, are pulled from you, from sort of downloads or PDF files, are, are from email. Um, things like statements, utility statements, medical provider statements, uh, charitable organizations, things of that sort. So when we took that thought and we started transactions to record. We took that thought and said, okay, let's just a guess, and you can put your known number in here. 250 files maybe per year for a family of four. If you did that for 10 years, and the number of families in the U.S. is maybe 100 million, that's 250 billion. If you look at the outside of the U.S. scenario, I don't know, times something, maybe times 10, that says the total estimate of maybe 2.5 trillion PDF files out there. <coughs> Change the numbers all you want. You can pick, you can just, if you don't want to use this model, try a different model. But come up, try to come up with your own estimate. And to me, it's an overwhelming indication of the success of PDF. PDF is dominant out there. And it's really, actually thanks to a lot of you out here, that that really is the case. Because it's not really just about what we did here at Adobe, but it's more the standards that are there that makes everybody feel comfortable that this stuff is gonna be durable. It's uh, all the other subset standards that are available too. So to me, it's a testament to the effort that you all put in that made this success. So if you look at uh, the growth, of, here's another question. Are we growing or are we shrinking over time? Now certainly there's gonna be documents that last for a little while, but the number of new files that are created, are they growing or are they shrinking? It's another hard one to really estimate, so I kind of went through the estimate proce uh, process. Today, if you just search for PDF files in the, and the, 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 the word 2015, it matches 992 million PDF files. So to me, that says that these files are relatively recent, right? And that we are still, um, you know, many, of the files that are up on the web on the web today are newer, and so to me that says, although I don't, I can't tell you what the growth is, estimates are like that. It's a good indication for the sort of longevity of PDF that they're continually. They're not 2010 files; they're new. They were newer, so we're continuing to grow. Quickly, some other interesting facts about PDF: a third from our data, a third of all PDFs are scanned. I guess the new Twain. Um, uh, project actually will be really good in some ways too. We can put them all in PDF. More that number probably will grow with that with that whole. Um, a billion desktop installs that happen that for Acrobat and Reader. Two hundred million mobile installs in that's that's Acrobat. And then Reader views today more than eighty billion PDF files per year. So. We're there. We're in the. We're in sort of. We, the PDF community, are sort of in this great dominant position. So I'm going to go quickly. I'll go through this quickly. But the top features that really kept there, and we've seen this a little bit in the use cases. Obviously, our big value is viewing and printing, um, and that's that's uh, stuff that happens all the time. So the other features, I think, Acrobat primarily is used for creation, right? Creation and all the ancillary things that you do associated with creation, like organizing pages or combining files together or maybe even export the, exporting the content to other areas. I mean, that's the core value of what P, uh, Acrobat provides to PDF. Um, then for the reviewing area, commenting, the ability to stamp and be able to uh, compare documents and stuff like that is another key high value, high usage model uh, area. Um, forms and signatures, filling in, sign, filling in forms, um, digital signatures with it, or, or e signer just filling in forms themselves or creating forms for that and then find out other areas that are the, the lesser used but still very important, for document protection, redaction standards, uh, print production, et cetera, accessibility. So the other standards I want to come through, there's clearly the standard PDF uh, portable document format that's being, that's being developed and continuing, 
and tuning. And then there's a bunch of subset standards as well. And then it sounds like there's going to be another one coming up too soon, so we'll, we'll be adding to that. Um, I think the value, what I really want to point out here is PDF, now we, have, we are actually so successful that PDF viewing is now being built into every platform. And so this is actually a real indicator of the fact that every platform today, I don't think PDF in any way was their core uh, value of the PDF, uh, of the platform, but their, their customers use PDF so much that they needed a solution that was provided for every platform. So Microsoft now has their own solution, and, when, and Apple has had that for quite a while. The browsers all now are starting to find where they generate, they have their own viewing solutions. Um, mobile has that within with uh, iOS and Android, not always by default, but almost every um, device uh, manufacturer provides a solution that's there. And then the web has, this is not, this is just a small list of the, all the different areas, but there's viewing solutions for the web as well. So this is a, a great indication of the fact that that we have up-leveled, PDF has been up-leveled to be a requirement for every platform. Um, you'll see later on, I'll have a talk about this because there are lots of implications with this particular success. So I guess the really big question I want to go to is, are we done with PDF? Uh, are we, from a, stand, from a document capability point of view, do we have more to do, right? And I guess you could argue, there, the yes case says, don't change the core value of PDF. Keep it the way it is. It works well. Um, and that is, reliably present a document just as the author intended. Um, today's PDF really fully realizes the gap. That, that would be the, the guess argument. Stay with it and just keep that going and, and keep um, tweaking that part. PDF is, a, an established, is already established as an ISO standard. Okay. Uh, and the brand is already well established. And if you ask anybody outside, that's outside the PDF community, what is what PDF is, almost everybody will give you a relatively consistent answer as to what that means to them. Right? So we've established a very strong brand for them. And I would argue that from an electronic document perspective, there's really no alternative file format that significantly threatens PDF today. Okay, in the no case, um, the uh, I think there's there are lots of interesting areas that we should think about here. I think the biggest threat really to PDF are the really the new work paradigms that people follow today. I'll talk about that in a second. I mean these paradigms really the interesting part about this is these paradigms exist or they didn't exist actually when we first created the PDF. So if you really look at that, you've got these new things that are coming in. And we're trying to tap this technology that was built around an old model. How do you think that old model fit into the new thing? We'll talk about what those mean. Um, PDF, actually, the, the no argument says that these paradigms are so important that we have to do a better job here. We'll see what that is. We'll talk about that. Or if we don't do it, the solutions will get designed out. Um, and then finally, the other one, I, I think there still exists an opportunity to define new areas of PDF that go beyond strictly what its core brand is, um, and that is a value for PDF users. So let's talk about this. One of the new work paradigms is the proliferation of devices that today can, can view PDF files. And we call it from watch to wall, right? With the watch, and every one of these devices are, uh, are capable of viewing PDF files. When we first started, <coughs> We were talking about pages that were in here, right? We were printing basically, we were, we we're taking an eight and a half and a by 11 and creating an electronic document that fit that size. Now that's great for a, lap, a desktop environment. That's great for a laptop environment that pretty much emulates a desktop environment. But what about tablets? What about tablets that are smaller now in size? What about smartphones that are even smaller? And now try to do the same thing on a watch. How can you take that content? How can you fit an eight and a half by 11 and make it fit into these phones? This is actually a big phone. Take a, try a small phone and see what that happens. So I think that's a real challenge that we have to make 
to, and, and the more and actually the the interesting part of this to me is I, we uh, I know at Adobe we tend to view this as a hybrid process where we have desktop products that we use and we also have mobile products but in some parts of the world they're skipping the desktop products they're going right to mobile right and so there's no in many cases we look at this as being well I if I can't view it here uh, I can go back to my desktop. But when you don't have that, and this is all you have, how do you make this a great experience? That, to me, is a fundamental question that we have to think about going forward. Here's another one, the web. right? And to me, the experience on the web has dramatically been improving over time. And where does PDF fit into that? right? I'd like it to be more on the left-hand side here, where we actually can, can integrate in a very seamless way. And there are solutions that, that still do that. And by the way, I, I want to preface some of this stuff is, some of these problems are not PDF. Some of these are viewers of PDF that have, that have some problems here. But, and I'm not, so I'm not actually um, bringing out the solutions, because some of the solutions will be viewer solutions, and some of the solutions will be PDF solutions. I just bring up the problem in general that I think we need to address. Whether that means we fundamentally have to enhance PDF to make that work or not, or, or we have to enhance a viewer, is really up to what the solutions are. But in this new work paradigm, which is the web, the experience on the web is getting richer and richer. The brand of PDF is more static documents. Feels like a disconnect to me. Feels like we need to do something to make that a better experience. Instead of having to download the PDF, how can we integrate PDF into the web experience? And today, the argument I would argue that PDF is really not, it's not very much of an argument, um, it's really not very well integrated into the web. We need that to be, to be fixed. Uh, dynamic rich documents. And there's really two use cases. There's two use cases here. Some of it is uh, documents are becoming, you know, let me walk through this whole thing. So do documents are becoming richer because the experience, the, the, that's, it's being allowed and it's actually a, a better experience for customers. How do we participate in that process? How do we do that in, both, in two different ways? There are rich documents that we need to find a way to create PDF files that can capture those documents in the appropriate way. And then there are dynamic documents that essentially have ways to update, like dashboard. <coughs> have ways where you can update the data and get newer views of that document. So it's a separation in the model view controller style thing, change the model out so that the views can be different. In today's world, PDF model and view, they're all kind of smudged together, right? And so it's a little bit harder to do that. And I think we also need to, need to look at whether or not we can address that issue uh, so that we can, mo we can modify ultimately the, the data, or in fact, Here's the other aspect of it is people want not only to get access to presentations, but they want to get access to the data. We'll get that in a second. That's the reuse case. Um, PDF content today is integrated with the presentation. And what you really want, in many cases we're finding, people would like to be able to get access to the content in addition to the presentation. How do we do that? How can we make that happen? So, and then I, I um, and I really think there are other opportunities as well, which is when you have something like a self-contained file format that provides consistent viewing everywhere, how, uh, what opportunities are there? And I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys to think through, because there are plenty of them that I can think of. But I, fundamentally, I really, where that we might be able to adapt PDF is really, uh, I think a, a, a big opportunity going forward. So if we're advancing PDF, we decide, OK, we're going to try to work on advancing PDF. How do we do this? And I want to get to the core of what I want to say here. Um, I mean, uh, PDF uh, needs, I think, needs to adapt to the industry trends. If we don't do that, we're going to become irrelevant. We have to go beyond a bridge from paper to digital. Now, I think we will always be in need of having it bridged from paper to digital. I don't think that will ever go away. But is that where you want to be? Is that where you want the brand or the value, the core of PDF to be? 
when you go over the other side of the bridge in the dynamic in so in the, the modern digital world, what experiences go on there that you can put into PDF? Right? Today, we are firmly in the middle of the bridge between paper and paper. <coughs> so um, I think the key thing to do on how to do that, which is as far as this, how do we advance PDF, how do we make changes to PDF without compromising the core brand that people value? Right? Because I think you could also create a point, a point you go too far, and people say, I don't understand what this is. It doesn't make sense for it to be PDF, and then you get people who will back off. So we have to do this in a very carefully thought out way. Okay. Um, the, uh, the, where Adobe fits in and the, with the PDF community is, frankly, we can't do it alone. We can't help advance this. And in fact, I would think that you'd want to all, as a group, figure out how we could move forward in this area. We don't own the viewers anymore. We're not the ubiquitous viewers that we were before. And back in the old days, we used to do the feature, add it to the viewer, add it to the creation part, and then get it out there, and then work on sort of documenting it later. That isn't going to happen anymore. The ecosystem is now taken over. And so new features really, they have to be viewable everywhere. How do we do that in, the con in that context? We need a strategy that includes more than just Adobe but includes all the other viewers, the other PDF community, to make this work out. I think that's the, the important message. If you remember our viewing ecosystem, this is the world that happens today. Every one of these things, provide, every one of these boxes provides a different viewer. How do we add new features to PDF and make those things work? We need a solution to that. So, what are the implications for multiple viewers? First of all, I think the next, the big one is inconsistency across viewers, and we see this a lot. We don't have a standard that defines an MVP, um, a minimum viable viewer, MVD, um, you know, something like that. Because so what happens is people are taking maybe their own analytics or their own intuition or whatever like that and building out a subset of the PDF standard because frankly the PDF standard is too rich. They can't do the whole thing, and so they end up doing a subset, and the subset uh, is inconsistent from one place to the next. And actually, to be honest with you, that compromises the brand of PDF. What are you, the whole point of PDF is that you can see something consistently. So we need to find a way to create something, a standard that people will consistently use. And I think that's a really, to me, that's a really important thing. Whether that's a defined as a subset MVP standard or whether we do a test suite that we say, this is, you know, this is the thing that you have to do in order to pass, in order for us to certify you as a viewer, as a valid viewer. Um, or if you really think about it, going forward, maybe you'll have levels of standards where you say this is an sort of elementary, sort of an elements version of it, uh, of the product, and or standard version, and there's a pro version that comes up, or something like that, that you can actually certify, maybe some certification process. Some way or another, we need to do that in order for us to, right now we're ad hoc. We don't do much about, about this process, but I think we should shame everybody to kind of follow, follow the standards. Something has to change, right? Or people will continue to do what they're doing, which is um, minimal work to support PDF. Not everybody. You know, so yeah, I, I worry not about the ones that are diligent on this and make this happen, but uh, I worry about the other people who are using, that have a requirement to do PDF on their platform, but they use it as a checklist item and they're necessarily going to do the MVP version of it that, and, and, and their own definition of MVP. MVP, by the way, is I define as minimum viable product. Um, are they willing to add new features? If you want a ubiquitous feature, a new feature out there, how are you going to handle it? Right? And I think fundamentally you've got to go past the point of what we've done in the past and create a model around which that stuff can happen through the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Another key part of this, I think, is that you have to have some compatible layer. We, we had this uh, feature that we implemented a while ago with Document protection. Document, Document protection, protection had this interesting characteristic that um, if you didn't support the document protection, it was you couldn't <coughs> see the document. It was gibberish, right? And so what happened was we needed a way for people, to, for viewers that didn't support our DRM, to at least show something up that says, and we call it page zero. 
um, says, say, you can't view this document in this viewer. Go get Adobe Reader or something like that. I think what we need to do is extend that, right? So that new features, potentially, instead of a page zero, we have a static view of the document that shows up there. That's always available to everybody, no matter what the viewer is. And then a capabilities um, dictionary concept where that if the capability, the viewer supports a particular capability, you can go to the richer model and, and, and display the feature. We need to figure out a way in which this can happen. And then if you think about how you add more features and add more features and more features, how is that process going to work as you iterate through this process and do this over and over again? An interesting challenge. So I'll go real quick. There's the creators at the same time need to be enhanced. By the way, this is a, so if you look at the purple part, this is purple, right? Purple part of this thing, uh, that, 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 that's the category of other. Um, and so all the little guys there, they're basically others as well. So if you look at the fragmentation of creators today, this is what they really are. All the fragments there, there are fragment creators everywhere. Everywhere, right? And that's okay and as part of it, but I think the important message for me in the creator, for, that I want to get across in the creator world is we need not only, you know, we'd like to have new features added to PDF, but creation is really the business, the money part of PDF today. Adding, you make money on creation, right? And so we can't, there's some aspect of it that you still, whether they do it or not, it's going to be the financial issue that they deal with. But the big part of it is the compatibility for legacy viewers that don't understand the new feature. And I think creation has to step up to that level of supporting the page zero, the concept of page zero. Sorry, I'm getting going here. Um, and, uh, you know, the creation vendors will determine what the, what's the best interest. But the fact is, I think, if, we ever, if they step up to add new features, they have, the concept, they have to support a compatibility model that allows for documents to be rendered uh, in any viewer so that we don't compromise the core of the brand of PDF is viewable everywhere. So, in conclusion, I think you know, customers have ultimately relied on PDF for the last 20 years. My goal, and I would hope that it's a goal of everybody here, is that we continue to keep PDF relevant for the next week. How do we do that? What are the steps that we have to make to kind of move forward? I think it's the ecosystem. I think it's us. In the environment that we have today, we have to leverage the ecosystem to, to, move, to move PDF forward. And I think moving PDF forward is required too many new things that, that, that are coming to play that we need to do, and that's going to be required. So it's a very different model for the way we used to work. We need to flesh out that model and make it so that it's viable. Okay? Thank you.